Okay, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, again, our theme verse. We're going to just read it one more time, and we're going to finish off uh, this morning's message. We kind of ran out of time. We didn't run out of steam, but we ran out of time. So uh, we want to read from 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. Again, it says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And we were trying to determine what was in the apostle's mind uh, when he wrote this. And we said that, uh, first of all, that there was the house of God there uh, in Ephesus where Timothy was left behind, uh, but it was a house of a false god. It, was, uh, it wasn't the living god. It was, a, it was a false god, and it was the temple of Diana. And it had pillars and all kinds of things, but it just didn't have God in it, not the living God. And so the other thing we said was that most likely, because Paul was a Jew, in the back of his mind was Genesis 28, where the house of God is mentioned for the first time in the Bible. And we have the idea of a pillar, and we have the ground, and we have the house of God, all those three things. And we were looking at nine principles that are found in Genesis 28 that will be found in the house of God throughout Scripture and throughout the history of the house of God. And we went through some of those, and we only got as far as number seven. And so I want to finish the three off before we move into our next uh, phase of this study. And so I want us to notice verse 19, if you would, of Genesis 28. Genesis 28, verse 19. And notice it says, And he called the name of the place Bethel, uh, which we know, uh, Beth is house, and El is Elohim, so it's the house of God, right? So he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of the city was called Luz at the first. So where he is, is a place called Luz, and he changes the name of that place from Luz to Bethel. Now what does Luz mean? We know that Bethel is house of God. What does Luz mean? Well, Luz means separation. And so it's interesting that uh, the house of God is composed of individuals who were once at Luz. They were once separated from God, <laughs> but now they've been reconciled. And these reconciled people who were once separated now constitute the house of God. And I find that quite remarkable, right? I mean, to think that, that I am now part of the house of God. Uh, I'm not just in it, I'm part of it because it's made up of living stones. And I'm one of those living stones in this spiritual house. So I am part of house of God, which is amazing. I was once separated, but now I'm part of house of God. And so uh, that's, a, that's a blessed thing. And we're thankful for that. What are the people who are connected with the house of God like? Well, they're like Jacob. Men who were rotten sinners, twisters, schemers, who were on the run <laughs> and running away from their trouble and their problems, and they met God as they ran away from God. And that's exactly who the house of God is comprised of, people like Jacob. We're a bunch of Jacobs, aren't we? And praise God, he saved us by his grace. And, uh, and so this is the kind of people that constitute this. And then the final thing is, it's a place where commitments are made. I want you just to notice that Jacob vowed a vow, verse 20, uh, and, and he talks about giving a tenth of all that he has and all the rest of it. And, and you know, we, we can discuss the rightness and wrongness of Jacob's thinking. Is he still being manipulative? All That's not my point. The point is that at the house of God, it's a place where commitments are made. And, and people have made big commitments in the house of God. People have presented their bodies a living sacrifice in the house of God. As they've heard the word of God unfolded, they've made decisions, life-changing decisions. Uh, they've made decisions to stop messing around with a bankrupt world and to live wholeheartedly for the Lord Jesus, even if they were already saved. Uh, they might have been saved, but not really living full throttle for the Lord. And in the house of God, they heard something that stirred them to the very core of their being, and they made decisions before God. And of course, it's wonderful, isn't it, when people make decisions in the house of God. The worst thing about the house of God is to come into the house of God and to leave unchanged. 
That's the worst thing, and, and it's good. We're going to discuss how we can do that, how we can make changes, right? We don't want to just blunder on uh, business as usual. We want to meet with God and be changed by God. And, of course, the house of God is a place where great commitments are made. And so let's go back now to 1 Timothy 3. And again, I want to tie this together as we finish up this little section. And I, I mentioned that uh, I, I really believe that this was at the back of Jacob's mind. And of course, the reason why I say that is he talks about uh, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And again, for a Jew, when he thought of Bethel, in his mind, he probably straight, went straight back here. That's the first place he would have gone. And then he says, it's the pillar and ground of the truth. Well, you remember Jacob, uh, he slept on this pillow, this rock pillow. But after this incident, he turned it up and made a pillar out of it. And uh, he, he, he said, that this, this is the house of God, you see. And so he set up a pillar. And I want to suggest to you that when he talks here about the house of God being the pillar and ground of the truth, well, where did he sleep? He slept on the ground, right? And so those two things come together with the word Bethel. And so let's just think of it in terms of ground and pillar. Because in every building, there's a ground, and usually there's pillars that hold up the structure, right? And, and so they all have significance. Ground is connected with foundation, right? Important foundation. And, and we would say that the house of God is built on a solid foundation, isn't it? Uh, upon this rock, I will build my assembly, right? That's the idea, right? It's a, that's a good foundation to build on, right? It's not Peter. He's not a good rock to build a foundation on. It's, it's Peter's confession. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16 is not about who Peter is. It's about who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am. That's what that passage is about. And the answer is uh, that he's the Christ. And upon that, that foundation of Jesus being the Messiah, the assembly is built on that foundation. And it's a solid foundation. And Paul would say, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, right? He's the foundation. And then the pillar in the ancient world, if you wanted to get a message out, you couldn't tweet the message, you couldn't use Facebook Messenger, you couldn't pick up the phone. If you want to get a message out, usually you would post the message on a pillar in a prominent place for people to read. A bit like Martin Luther in his 95 Theses, right? He did it on the, not the pillar, but he did it on the door. But the idea was a place where people are going to be coming. And of course, in the, in the Mediterranean world, doors were not as significant, right? Because it, it was warmer, right? In, in, you go to a church in Germany, you've got to have a door shut to keep the cold out, right? So everybody has to pass through it, but you've got pillars. And so it would be a place for the truth to be posted that you want out for people to understand. So I believe the house of God is where the truth is, the foundational truth is defended. It's the ground, it's the foundation, and where that truth is proclaimed. And, and so the truth of God is to be proclaimed from the house of God. And again, I say this, that uh, we, we, we said last night, why is the house of God so essential? Because the only place you're going to hear the truth. You, you're not going to hear the truth from the government anymore, sadly. Now, I mean, I wish I could say differently, but they have a way of putting their spin on what they want you to believe. And that's just the way it is. Uh, you're not going to get truth in universities anymore. Uh, even, uh, I mean, yeah, there's somebody who can say by experience, but, but there's an agenda in university. And it's not to teach you reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's social engineering. It's to take away any of the, the, the education and upbringing you had from your family to believe in God and follow God. It's to undermine that whole thing. It, it's wickedness, actual wickedness going on. In, in our secular universities, and even in some Christian universities. Many Christian universities have adopted theistic evolution. Many Christian universities have adopted psychotherapy. And, and basically, they're in great error. So the place where you would expect to get truth is the house of God. 
And it, of course, we, we think back to days, and this is why perhaps we're lamenting, is that there was a day when, when our government was different. There was a day when they had ideas like, let's have a day of thanksgiving to God. I mean, that was a great idea, wasn't it? I love that. I, I, that's, you don't get that any other country. I, Canada has one now, I think, too. But they tend to do whatever America does, at, at least for a while. But there's a lot of good things about the government in this country in the past, but why was that? And I want to suggest to you that if our government has ever defended truth, it was the product of revival in the house of God that affected the White House. Okay? So if I can put it this way, change, if we want to see change in the White House, that change must first begin in the house of God and from the house of God affecting your house and ultimately affecting the White House. So why America was a great nation was because they experienced the first great awakening. They were started, yes, the, the Puritans came to build the Puritan paradise and all the rest of it, but, but, but soon it went bad. And it became very secular. And there was a great awakening. And then there was a second great awakening. And so, in a sense, the, the effects of that affected the whole culture and climate of America in a good way. And if we want to see this country, if we want to, if I may steal the phrase of somebody well-known, make America great again, no politician is capable of doing that. It's only the gospel of Jesus Christ that can transform any nation. Amen. And we have to get back to that simple foundation, which, which takes us to our next point. And our next point is we talked about going through the house of God in 1 Timothy, and we, we said <clears throat> uh, as in our outline, house of God and its gospel and to pray for evangelists. So I'd like you to look now, 1 Timothy 1. We're moving on from uh, the connection with uh, Genesis 28, and I want to think now, please, of the house of God and its gospel. And I want to break in at verse 8, if I can, of 1 Timothy. And before I do, maybe I'll just kind of do a preamble before I jump into the text here. One of my favorite Bible teachers... Uh, who passed away recently from COVID uh, was Randy Amos. Some of you have listened to Randy uh, on Voices for Christ. Wonderful, gifted brother in the Lord. I remember him speaking one time at a conference, and he, he, he described a local assembly in this way. He said, a local assembly is like a three-legged stool. And he says, the problem with a three-legged stool is if you lose a leg, you're going to fall over. It'll collapse. And then he went on to describe the three legs of a local assembly. They said, he said, leg number one is this, that the local assembly is designed to minister to the heart of God. That's worship. And we need to recognize that, right? Part of the reason we're going to do it tomorrow morning, when we come together, we're going to come for one purpose. We're going to remember the Lord Jesus, right? It's not the worship meeting, it's the remembrance meeting. But as we remember the Lord Jesus, you can't remember him with any sense of reality without being caused to worship. And so it becomes the worship meeting, even though it's never used in that description, is not given that, that way. But just as a result of calling to remembrance what Jesus did for us on Calvary and who he was, his person and his work, it's hard to meditate and mull that over for long without bursting forth in worship. And so we'll minister tomorrow to the heart of God because he delights in his son and he delights to hear us delighting in his son. And so the heart of God will be blessed tomorrow. And ours will be as well. We'll carry something away with us. And then, secondly, an assembly ministers to one another. That's fellowship and edification, right? So, so this conference, I know that you're going to be blessed this weekend. And it's not just because of anything Mike Atwood's going to say, but you're, going to be, you're already blessed by the fellowship, 
at least I am. I'm, we had some great conversations and been encouraging to meet new people and people who were serious about the Lord and, and hear some of their stories. And I don't know about you, but I'm already, I'm ready to go home. I'm filled. I'm, I'm enjoying myself immensely. And that fellowship is rich. It builds you up. It edifies you. So, we, so we've, had, we've ministered to one another, fellowship, service, edification. But here's the third leg. A local assembly ministers to the heart of God, ministers to one another, and it ministers to a lost and broken world. That's evangelism. And I believe that many of our assemblies are broken. They're at best two-legged stools. Some of them are only one-legged stool. They, they know how to minister to the heart of God, but they're not very good at ministering to one another, and they're certainly not ministering to a lost and dying world. And they're broken. And I believe that part of our problem is that we've lost the gospel in many of our assemblies. I remember in my early days as a Christian, and of course, as you get older, some of you young guys, you're going to have to put up with this for a minute, but when you get older, you reminisce. You hang around some of these older guys. They'll, I mean, you, you won't be long, and they'll be reminiscing, and they'll be talking about the good old days, right? And, and there's a reason for that. They have good remembrance of those days. And I remember as a new convert, saved out of Catholicism, coming into a testimony that was vibrant evangelically. And, and so in the first three years as a believer, tent crusades. This is in England. This is in darkest England, right? Being involved directly in three tent crusades, being directly involved in four evangelistic campaigns. I mean, God was working. Souls were being saved. It was a vibrant evangelicalism that I was saved, an aggressive evangelicalism. Our assembly, we did a weekly open-air meeting. We, 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 we did evangelistic coffee mornings. We had Sunday night gospel services, and the gospel was constantly being proclaimed, and people were getting saved. And it was electrifying. And I miss that. I, I think I've gone from aggressive Christianity to anemic Christianity for the most part. Apathetic Christianity, not aggressive, and certainly not in the gospel. And I think there's a reason for that. And I, mean, I want to just talk a little bit about gospel. We're going to get into the text. We're going to look at the text. Don't, don't worry, we're going to get there. But one of the things I find has been interesting is that I was at a, a National Elders and Workers Conference in the year 2000. I'll never forget it. There was a brother there. He got up. I won't say his name, but he got up and he gave a passionate plea for gospel preaching in the local assembly. And he was shot down. And I was embarrassed for him. I actually, because the guy poured his heart out, and, and it was like people just, you talk about quenching the spirit, people, people got a fire hose, and they just put him out completely. And they had reason behind it. What they said was, and I'm going to give you their logic, because I've thought about this. I mean, this is 2000, and now 2022, I'm still thinking about it. This was... This was a changing moment in assembly testimony in North America, I believe. And what they said was, you come into the house of God for edification, and you go out into the world with the gospel. Now, that sounds great, right? Doesn't it? I mean, I, I can see that. You come in to be edified, you go out with the gospel. Sounds really good. But I have some issues with it. First of all, How's the theory working? Are we going out with the gospel? In many assemblies, we're not. We say we are. We might have some individuals who give out some tracts when they go to the restaurant. Uh, they, they may give a poor tip, but they give a tract anyway. But, but we, we don't have much in terms of evangelistic activity in many of our assemblies. Shame on us. We don't. And so we're not coming in to be edified and going out to evangelize. This, this is 20, about 22 years to observe this, you see, and I'm telling you, it's not working. We're not doing it. <clears throat> Here's a question. What is the apostles' doctrine? 
Remember Acts, like our cardinal verse, Acts 2, 41 and 42, right? Uh, those that believed his word were baptized and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayers. So I might ask the question, well, what, what is the apostles' doctrine? What actually did the apostles teach? Well, if you, if you read their epistles and if you listen to their sermons in the book of Acts, I'll tell you the core message that they preached was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I, I think there's another name for that. It's called the gospel. They were passionate about the gospel. That's what they preached. It was their essential message. Look at Romans chapter 1. I want you to see this, and then we're going to jump into our text here and just see why this is so critical. Romans chapter 1, and <clears throat> I'd like us to look at verse 15. Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. So Paul says this, So as much as in me is... In other words, with every fiber of my being, he says, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now, let me ask you a question. This is not the question and answer session, but I'm going to ask you a question. Who was he writing to in Rome? The church. And the church comprises of what? Christians. Is that interesting? So he's writing to believers, and he's telling them that he's going to come and visit them. And he says, when he comes to visit them, he says, with every fiber of my being, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you, to you, the, the recipients of his letter, to you, he says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are, are, are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And, and then, of course, he writes this epistle to them. And what's the epistle about? It's about the gospel, isn't it? Isn't it the finest unfolding of the gospel in the entire Word of God in Romans? And it was written to Christians. Obviously, Paul didn't get the memo from our Elders and Workers Conference that you come in to edify and the gospel doesn't fit with edification. You go out with the gospel. It's not for in. Paul never got that memo. And he didn't get it in the early chapters of 1 Corinthians either. And he didn't get it in Galatians either because they're all about the gospel written to believers. And can I ask you, have you ever, have you ever been, uh, maybe you, you haven't had that many times where you've heard gospel meetings and gospel preaching, but have you ever heard, if you ever have had, have you ever heard gospel preaching and went away edified, even though you were already saved? Having the cross, as it were, as Paul says in Galatians, setting forth Jesus Christ as crucified among them. And so you've had somebody preach the gospel and done it with such clarity, it was almost like you were there at the cross, right? Crucified among them, and you were there, and you were watching and witnessing the events of Calvary, and you felt like you were there, and you had to make a decision about the one in the, in the center cross. Have you ever been in that kind of meeting? I'll tell you, there's nothing like it. You come away, your heart's bursting, and you're saying to yourself, if I weren't already saved, I'd get saved tonight. But you know you are, but you want to tell it to somebody else. And I want to say that, that as a young convert out of Catholicism, you know, we used to always have this thing in Catholic Church about confirmation. You know, so you got baptized as a baby, and then you got confirmed when you were 12. And, of course, they would use scriptures about confirmation in scripture. And, of course, there are in the King James. Uh, Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith that we... That we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Uh, Acts 15, 32, Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And then Acts 15, 41, they went through Syria, Cilicia, confirming the churches. And of course, uh, we read in Philippians 1, 7 and 8, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. And so as a new believer, hearing gospel preaching night after night 
was my confirmation classes. And at the end of that, I not only knew what I believed, why I believed it, and how to share it. Illustrations from good gospel preaching I was able to use at work sharing the gospel across the desk. It was transforming. And there are Christians today who are not hearing that kind of preaching. And they're wobbly. They're all over the shop. They're not confirmed, right? They don't have that solid foundation in the gospel. And so they're blown to and fro because of it. And so I just want to say, I know this assembly has young men, and these young men are encouraged to preach. Praise God for that. I think that's a great principle. But could I just say this? In Ireland, you would never be allowed to teach in the assembly unless you could prove yourself in the gospel first. And what they said was this, if you're not right on the gospel, you're not right. Prove that you can do that first, and then we let you talk about the blessings that come from the gospel. But you prove the gospel first. Same as on Honduras. I was ta- a, a young man, just a delightful young brother, stayed with us recently, and uh, he was telling me, he said he, he is from the gospel halls in Honduras, and he said they have to learn to preach the gospel before they will ever let them near the pulpit to teach anything else. I like that. I think that's a sensible principle. So can I encourage this practical? I know we're we're jumping the gun here, but a practical thing, let's get some of these young guys and get them up here and and maybe have one Sunday a month where you really encourage, invite friends and and, and visitors or unsaved people and have these young guys preach the gospel. See how that goes. It'll do them good. It'll do you good to listen to it. And it might even be a result in the souls being saved. To hear passionate young men telling of the love of the Savior at Calvary. I think that might do some good. So, back in our passage, having got that off my chest, you know, kind of, sometimes just good to get things off your chest, isn't it? I just feel like if we don't get the gospel back, it's over. Like, I'm praying for revival, and I believe revival is twofold. Every time there's a revival... There's two things. First of all, God's people get desperate enough to get serious about praying. That's number one. That's a good sign. When you see God's people getting... They realize our cleverness can't fix this. They recognize that. It's, God, you've got to do something here. There's a desperation. How bad does it have to get, by the way, before we get desperate? I'm kind of curious. Because we've witnessed nothing but decline for 40 years. Like, at what point do we say, Lord, we need help, Right? Second thing is, every revival, there's a restoration in aggressive gospel preaching. Every revival. And so if you want to see it, we've got to get back to these things. There's no way around it. This is the way forward. And so in, in, back in 1 Timothy chapter 1, as we look at this text, I want you to notice it begins with the law and the gospel. And that was because people were trying to use the law in a wrong way. So notice verse 8, it says, We know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. In other words, there's, there's an unlawful way to use the law. And, there, and there's a lawful way to use the law. And he says that the law is a good thing. Uh, we know the law is good if a man use it lawfully, if he use it correctly. And I want to suggest to you what the law is, is basically prep school. It's to prepare a man to receive the gospel. The law is prep school. The gospel is finishing school. So it goes like this. If you you want to be well, first thing you've got to get is a diagnosis. And then, once you've got the diagnosis, you need a cure. Okay? The law is the diagnosis. It diagnoses the condition of man and shows him to be what he really is, a helpless, lost sinner. And so we need a law work before we have a gospel work. We need to get men lost before they'll want to be saved. A diagnosis before cure, conviction before conversion. And the law does that. And so we often hear things like the law is a ruler. 
Now, a, a ruler, you know, if I did freehand, and I'm, I'm, I'm good at this, I write in my Bible, and, and I, I've got this, uh, this nice wide margin Bible, I'm not going to make any comment, Eric, but it's really nice, and, and I've got a lot of uh, notes in it, and it looks straight to me when I'm writing it, but then when I look at it, it always goes up. It's never perfectly straight, ever. And you can come, you can look if you want afterwards. It always goes up. But when I'm writing it, it looks perfectly straight. But when I put a ruler under it and try and draw, especially if I'm doing a heading and I want to put a straight line, uh oh, I got it. It's hard to do it because because I'm going up. You see, the 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 ruler shows how crooked my handwriting is. All right, it really does. The law shows how crooked a person is. Or it's like a thermometer. A th thermometer is designed to show you you're sick, not to make you well, right? So you've got a high fever, stick that in your mouth, it'll make you better. No, what it'll do, and we've got a doctor in the house here, you've got to verify this, it's just showing how sick you are, right? That's all it's doing. It's not curing you, not helping. The law shows how sick we are. And we need a law work. We need to preach the law as the schoolmaster, as Paul would say, to bring them to Christ, to get men lost. And that's part of door-to-door uh, -door work. I, I, what I enjoy about door-to-door -door work is getting people lost. I, I really do. And, and it's amazing. People get really mad because a lot of people are trusting in the wrong things. And you can, just with a few key questions, you can show them they're thinking in the wrong things. And by the time they leave, they're devastated. You've, you've kicked their props from under them. They need that. Because they'll never trust in Christ until they recognize how rotten they are and that they're not good persons. And I've used this illustration before, but I never forget it because it's just emblazoned in my mind. I met a guy, told me. He'd never done anything wrong. He was a perfect man, uh, and God had to let him into heaven because he was such a good person. And he said it brazen. I mean, he was just clear as a bell. This is my condition. And I asked him if he was married. He said, what's that, what's that got to do with anything? I said, I just wanted to talk to your wife. It must be amazing to be married to a man like that. Does she, is that what she thinks? He did not want me to meet the wife. Because <laughs> she had a different story to tell. And so what we're doing, we're, we're getting people lost. So that we can get them saved. And so he talks about the law, the right use. We know the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man. Oh, if only our friends in Armstrongism and uh, Galatianism in all its forms, Seventh-day Adventists, if only they could just recognize the law is not made for a righteous man. It's not. Not made for a righteous man. But for the lawless and disobedient, for ungodly, for sinners, for unholy, profane, murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers. And he goes through this ugly list. The lawless. People who are aware of the law, but break it, ignore it, flout it. And there are a lot of people like that. Our culture is becoming increasingly lawless, isn't it? Not that people don't know what the law is. They're just flouting it. They don't care. There's a lawlessness today. Disobedience insubordinate, rebels against authority of any kind. Again, isn't that our society? This is, this is a good diagnosis of current American life. This is us. This is our society. <clears throat> As we said yesterday, the ungodly, uh, it, general, it begins in general terms here, and he's going to move towards the specific, but there are people who can get along without God. They refuse to include him in their life. For sinners, those that fell short of the mark, for the unholy, there's nothing holy about their life. In fact, they boast about being unholy, profane, secular, irreverent, no sense of the sacred, murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, patricide and matricide. Kind of interesting. Murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers. Increasingly, you see that, don't you? In the headlines, some son is killed their parents for some trivial reason. And it starts when their little gurriers in Walmart and they can't get what they want and they're hitting their parents. That's how it begins, striking them and eventually 
killing them off. And of course, culturally, we're heading in the direction where the easiest way to deal with unwanted elderly loved ones is already in Canada, assisted suicide. We're just going to help them out. Just give them an injection. I mean, what's the big difference? You kill them at the birth, kill them at the end. It doesn't make any difference, right? Once you've gone down that road, the next step from killing babies is killing old people that are a drain on society and using too many resources, and let's get rid of them. And this is all already in Canada. They're talking about these things. What happens there is going to come here. This is, this is what's going on. And the law is for people like this. It's to show them their fault in these areas. He says, for whoremongers, for the sexually immoral, the adulteresses, for those that defile themselves with mankind, that's male homosexuals. Again, how relevant. This is, this is, this is the world we're living in, even though it's written uh, in the early uh, days of the first century. It's amazing how relevant it is. Uh, it says for men stealers, uh, human traffickers, we would call it, kidnappers, slave traders, for liars, and it goes on and on, and it says this, for anything that's contrary, at the end of verse 10, to sound doctrine. And, and the minute he talks about sound doctrine, this healthy doctrine, the very next statement is this, How do we test the soundness of doctrine? He said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. You see, we we talked a lot about doctrine, but if the gospel is not front and center of our doctrine, it's false doctrine. We don't have a message for this world if we ignore the gospel of the Lord Jesus. According, he says, to the, the, the glorious gospel by Paul never lost sight of the glory of the gospel. The gl- because nothing brings glory to God more than a rebel and a lawbreaker and a sinner and all this list who gets converted and becomes a worshiper whose life is transformed. There's nothing more glorifying to God than that. And that's why it's the glorious gospel. It transforms us. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And then it says, which was committed to my trust. Now, was it just Paul that was given that sacred deposit of the gospel? Was it just him? Or were you given that sacred deposit of the gospel? You see, it seems to me that Paul says that those that have been reconciled to God in 2 Corinthians are those that have been given the ministry of of reconciliation. So that must mean that you and I also have been given this sacred deposit, this sacred trust, committed to our trust. What are we doing with that that we've been entrusted with, the gospel? Both collectively and individually, what are we doing with the gospel? He said, it's committed to my trust. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me, but that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. I like that. By the way, that word ministry is diakonos. Making me a deacon. Interesting, isn't it? I'm just, uh, I did a major study on that word diakonos, and it's very, very interesting, not what you would think. And so basically, one of the things the Apostle Paul couldn't get over, I'd say there were two things that, that he never, ever recovered from. One is that God saved him. He never got over that. He'd say things like this, he loved me. Just staggered by that. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. Do you feel that way? Do you feel like you can never get over it? I I feel that. I'm amazed that God would ever save a wretch like Mike Atwood. I'm still staggered, but he did. (laughs) Praise God he did. But then he says, not only am I amazed that he would save me, but that he would put me into the ministry. That he would want to use me. And by the way, that's true of every Christian, right? We we, we believe every Christian is a full-time worker in the sense that every Christian is on the Lord's team and is to serve the Lord up. We, We may do other things during the day 
to earn our keep, but we do that so we can do this, preach the gospel. Right? We have a high calling, a very high calling. And, and so Paul's amazed, he's staggered. He loves me. He gave me this ministry. I mean, he, he wants somebody like me who was so opposed to him, so much of a persecutor, and he actually wants me on his team. That's amazing, isn't it? You, you, I don't know if you, I guess you didn't grow up with soccer. You, you had an underprivileged childhood, I guess. But, but we grew up with soccer. And when we played soccer, of course, we used to play every, every playtime at school. And they used to pick sides. And of course, always the best two players would pick the rest. And, and of course, it got down to the, kind of the end where you just got, you know, Mike Atwood left and a couple of other guys. And then they have no option, but they pick you. But you can tell it's only because there's nobody else left. God doesn't feel that way about you. He wants you on his team. And he said, I can use you. And especially, he says, if you're weak and foolish, you're exactly the person I want. Because I get all the glory that way. And he loves that. Isn't it great to be wanted by him? To, be a, a, to, to, to serve him? And Paul just loved that. And so we're accountable. We're, we're stewards. We, we've been given the gospel. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Are we faithful in this sacred deposit of the gospel that he's given to? He says, uh, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before, he says, a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. And so Paul talks about what he was like before, you see, who was before. And that's why he's so staggered that God would A, save him, and B, want him on his team, because he said, before I was a blasphemer. Now again, by the way, this is an indirect affirmation of the deity of Christ. Because Paul says, I was before a blasphemer, but I, I guarantee he never, ever blasphemed God the Father, or Jehovah. Who did he blaspheme? Jesus. And yet he's guilty of blasphemy, which, which must mean Jesus is God, right? Because you can't blaspheme somebody if they're not deity. He says, I was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. <laughs> and so he talks about, by the way, all this conduct that he talks about was when he was a devoted son of the law. See? See, the law didn't do him much good, right? He was a blasphemer under the law. He was injurious to other people under the law. He, 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 was, uh, he, he was a persecutor under the law. This is what the, the law didn't do him any good at all. He did all this stuff as under the law. And so then he says, <clears throat> very interesting to me as he thinks about these things, he says, that's what I used to be. He says, but I obtained mercy. I obtained mercy. I want to just think about this idea of his being injurious, because he gives us more details. And I think it's just interesting to see how harmful this man was prior to his conversion. Acts 22 would be a good place to begin, and verses 4 and 5. Notice what he says. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them, which were there bound to Jerusalem, for to be punished. I persecuted this way unto death. Right? So clearly, people died at his hands. I persecuted this way unto death. Let's look at another scripture, Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. It says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth 
which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. When, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange cities. So not only was he a blasphemer himself, he actually compelled them to blaspheme. This guy was a mean man. But it says, I obtained mercy. Isn't that wonderful? Because he did it ignorantly in unbelief. He, he didn't realize who Jesus was. As soon as he realized who Jesus was, he recognized what a mistake he'd made. But at the time, he thought he was serving God. He was doing God's service. He was convinced he was. And he says in verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Don't you love that? The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. We would say this, super abundant. Super abundant grace. Don't you love super abundant grace? It resulted in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. It changed him forever. From this injurious person to a man filled with faith and love, which doesn't come from him, because we've already seen what he's like, which is in Christ Jesus. He's got a new source of love in his heart, and it's the love of the Lord Jesus that's in his heart. And it's changed, it's a game changer. It's changed him forever. And he says, this is a faithful saying. And of course, Paul mentions several faithful sayings in his pastoral epistles. But he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Is that changed? Does he still want to save sinners? Group that I pray with on a morning, I just heard yesterday morning, a friend of mine, Eric, not this Eric, another Eric, Eric Smith, had the joy of leading a neighbor to the Lord. Just two days ago, he said this morning he came at 6.20 a.m. to his house, <laughs> and they had a little Bible study together, and this man prayed publicly for the first time. So, He's a two-day-old baby. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That changed? No, he's still saving sinners. Isn't that wonderful? He's still saving sinners. And I'm sure somewhere right now in this world, somebody is passing from death to life because he's still saving sinners. And he says, by the way, of whom I am chief. And the implication is this, like if the chief has already fallen, then all the rest, there's hope for everyone, right? In other words, if the worst sin is gone, then everybody else has got a chance. And he wants you to know, I'm the chief, so, so there's hope for everyone. God could save me, he said he could save anyone. And then he talks about, how be it, verse 16, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So what he says is actually my conversion is a pattern conversion. I like that. I don't know if you ever thought about Paul as a pattern conversion, but I want to mention some things about this pattern conversion that are probably standard in almost every conversion that, that was true of his conversion. So I want you to go with me, first of all, to Romans 16 and verse 7. Romans 16, verse 7. And this is a verse that I only noticed recently, but it was like jumping off the page at me when I saw it, and I thought, how did I miss that? But he says in Romans 16, verse 7, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of no among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Now notice that. Paul has two kinsmen, kinfolk, right? They're related relatives of Paul, and he says, who were in Christ before me. So these two relatives of Paul came to saving faith in Jesus Christ before Paul did. 
Now, what do you do when you get saved and you have relatives that are unsaved? Have you, have you ever done anything for people like that? What do you normally do for them? Anybody? Pray for them, right? Have you ever prayed for anybody that's a relative of yours that's not yet saved? I suspect that Paul was saved because he was the object of prayers of unsaved relatives. Oh, of saved relatives, sorry. I believe that's what was going on. There were people, and he mentions these, they're obviously fine Christians. If they're noted by the apostles, they must be solid believers, and they're his relatives, and they were in Christ before him, and I'm sure they were praying for his salvation. And so that usually happens when somebody gets saved. Somebody's praying somewhere for their salvation. He also had heard the word of God because he was present when Stephen gave his magnificent sermon in Acts chapter 7. And he heard every word of it. And he also witnessed Stephen, and it says in Acts 6 verse 15, that Stephen's face shone like that of an angel. So, so, I mean, clearly, this man is a man who was in the presence of God. And his face shone like an angel's. And he heard a sermon from a man who was glowing because of his relationship with Jesus Christ. And Saul heard that sermon. And I don't believe he ever forgot it. Remember when the Lord says it's hard for you to kick against the goads? You know, this idea of these pricks? You know, kind of, it's like cattle. You want to go into, uh, into a cattle crush and, and you have a sharp pointed stick and you, you, you give it some encouragement to go in the right direction. And, and, and it eventually does because you don't like having its back end being pricked, you see. And so Paul was saying that he was being pricked before he was ever, God's saying to Paul, you, you were pricked before you were ever saved. Something was eaten away at him. Something was bothering him. And what was it? I believe he never forgot Stephen. Never. I believe he went to bed at night, and even though he's intent on putting an end to all this Christianity, he could probably hear the echo of Stephen's words and see his face. And so <clears throat> he witnessed this. And then the law was convicting him as well. Uh, look at Romans chapter 7. He talks about the impact of the law upon him. And he says in Romans 7, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin taken occasion by commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. And so I want to suggest to you that not only was Stephen's testimony speaking to him, but the law of God had come to him in a new convicting power that he had not known before. Because there was a time when he was a self-righteous Pharisee, and he said concerning the law, blameless. And for a while there, he was deceived into thinking that he was keeping all of them and acing every one. But then the Spirit of God brought the law of God to him in new power. And it was one particular one, thou shalt not covet. And I don't know what it was that he was coveting, we're not told. But something, it just, he wanted that thing desperately, and he realized, what a covetous heart I have. And the law says, thou shalt not covet. And so it slew him, it, can, it showed him what, a, what a, a sinner he was. And it flawed his self-righteousness. And all this is before he saw Christ on that road to Damascus. And so there's, there's stuff going on. In the, people are praying. Stephen's message, the gold, eaten away at him. And then the law comes with force. And then, like every sinner, under that conviction, we get a glimpse of who Christ is. And on that road to Damascus, he saw who Jesus really was. He got a glimpse of the glory of Christ. That he's the only hope for sinful humanity. And he saw that and he saw him. Not, not just the fact that he was the one that was crucified, but he was risen and now glorified. And he saw that and he believed that and he was converted. And so what does he do? Having talked about the gospel and 
the fact that it did that for him, what next? Well, there's an out, outburst of praise. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so we would put it in this way, to God be the glory, great things he has done. Right? He, may, he just can't contain it. He bursts with praise to the great God who ordained this amazing plan that would redeem the worst of sinners through the work of his son. And so can I encourage us, when we think about the house of God, if an epistle written to talk about how to behave in the house of God begins with a fresh emphasis on the importance of the gospel. Do you think that we as a house of God, as the house of God, need to get the gospel back? Where, where do we start? Well, that's a good thing we can discuss in our discussion groups. But if we don't get it back, it's over. We're just a Christian social club. And God would be right to say, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You've lost your reason for living. You're a lampstand, and a lampstand is meant to shine brightly in the darkness. How brightly are we shining for Jesus in our community? Do they even know we exist? You know, it's kind of an amazing thing as an itinerant preacher. Sometimes you're new to an assembly and you ask directions. This was before the days of GPS. But you ask for directions. And sometimes even with GPS, you need directions. But you ask for directions, and they'll say, do you, know, do you know where this chapel is? Never heard of it. It's a block away from where you are, and they've never heard of it. And some of our assemblies, they've heard of us, but for all the wrong reasons. Tragically. We've got to get our names on the billboards again, not because we want to make much of us, but because we have a message they need to hear, and that's Christ and Him crucified. May God help us recover the gospel for the house of God. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this time uh, together in the Word, and we do pray again you'd continue to help us as we look at the house of God together and meditate on these things and Lord, we do pray for change. We don't want to continue as we are. We want to be changed. Lord, make us gospelers again. People with a great zeal to see souls one to the Savior. Uh, revolutionize our prayer meetings, Lord, that we'd be not just praying about sick people, but uh, we'd be praying about a sick world and the cure being the Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, do a work among us, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.